Hey everybody and welcome back to Virtual Berlin Tours with me, Nick Jackson. I'm standing on a bit of wasteland, but it's not just any wasteland. This was the death strip of the Berlin Wall. There are very few places in Berlin where you can still actually see this, but I'm up here where the French sector on that side of the road met the Soviet sector, just over here. And we're going to be thinking about the two most successful tunnels under the Berlin Wall, Tunnel 29 and Tunnel 57, both eventually named after the numbers of people that managed to escape from East Berlin to West Berlin where the tunnel started in the early 1960s. This is the Benauer Strasse, and over here you can see where those trees are. That's where the Berlin Wall used to stand, and the road and the houses on the other side. That was the west, that was the French sector. Over here you can see why there's not much of this uh, death strip area left, because it's all being redeveloped. But just to the right of this modern building here um, was where the other wall was, and this was the killing ground uh, in between. And the reason I've come to tell you about these stories on the Benauer Strasse is rather specific, because there were many tunnels dug under the Berlin Wall, over 70. Very few of them were actually successful or even completed. But there's a reason why the two most successful tunnels were here on the Bernauer Strasse and another street in Berlin called the Heidelberg Strasse, where many tunnels, nearly 30, were also attempted as well. And that is the line that the Berlin Wall was built on. That is the solution um, to why Bernauer Strasse, amongst other reasons, was chosen. So, um, as I'm sure you know, the Berlin Wall was built in August of 1961 as a result of this exodus of mainly young East Germans flooding out of communist East Germany as things started to get difficult in the late 50s and 60s into West Berlin so they could access the rest of the free world. And eventually, West Berlin, an island of freedom in the middle of communist East Germany, had a wall built all the way around it, the famous Berlin Wall, 161 kilometers of barrier to stop people accessing that last back door out of the communist world. But the wall was built on agreed district boundaries that had been agreed at the beginning of 1945. So even by the time World War II was finished, the 20 districts of Berlin, and these district boundaries have been lines on a map, in some cases for centuries, they had divided Berlin on paper into two. You had the eight districts of the Soviet sector, the historic heart really, and you had the what were originally garden suburbs, 12 western districts divided between Britain, America and France. And in fact, as I said, this um, area on the other side of the trees was the French sector. So lines on the map divided Berlin from 1945. As the exodus of young East Germans increased, um, the barrier was reinforced. So by the late 50s, you already had little bits of wall, little bits of barbed wire and checkpoints and whatnot to monitor the flow of people from east to west and back again. It was still an open city. But by August of 1961, the wall was shut and he had many people whose closest, dearest friends and relatives now found themselves on the wrong side of the wall. So we're going to start with the story of Tunnel 29. Just over here, I'll go take you to the place in a sec. They used to be the ruins of a factory. And in the spring of 1962, um, having looked around for a, a viable place, two Italians would decide that the ruins of a factory that you actually used to make twizzle sticks, you know those sort of plastic sticks you, you have olives and stuff on um, for cocktails and whatnot, a factory, the ruins of a factory stood on the other side of the road, the cellars were intact, they were deep from, a sh uh, from there, from the cellar a shaft could be sunk deep underground and a tunnel would be dug all under this area past where this modern house is to the Schönholzstrasse number seven or number six. Um, as it is today. And we're going to tell you the story first of Tunnel 29. Why the Benauer Strasse? There were two streets where most of the tunnels were dug initially, 62, 63. Um, and they were Benauer Strasse, for reasons I'll explain in a minute, here, and a place called the Heidelberg Strasse. Heidelberg Strasse was between the American sector and the Soviet sector in the southeast of the city, and the district boundary that where the wall would eventually be built went ran right down the middle of a little road. So, in the early years of the Berlin Wall, they had houses on both sides, had that on the Bernauer Strasse as well, that's an advantage. But the distance between cellar to cellar, west-east, east-west on the Heidelberg Strasse was somewhere around 25, 30 metres. One of the narrowest, um, shortest tunnels um, would have to be dug there. Problem was, Berlin's got a very high groundwater. And at the Heidelberg Strasse, just like the rest of the city, it was around four metres. So digging a tunnel, it couldn't be that deep. Um, that meant it was easy to find. Um, it also caused things like the, you know, the tarmac of the road to slip or sink and there'd be cracks and the East German border guards would be able to see your tunnel. So Heidelberg Strasse was eventually abandoned um, because East Germany could solve the problem literally by digging this massive trench right down the road to the groundwater, which meant you couldn't go below that because otherwise your tunnel would be submerged. Then our Strasse has got a better advantage than the Heidelberg Strasse. Here, you can dig your tunnel to 15, 16 meters below the ground before you hit water. And Berlin's actually quite sandy 
the soil matrix uh, that I'm standing on. But here at about 15, 16 meters, which would have been roughly the depth of Tunnel 29, you're looking at a matrix of kind of clay and sand, which meant that the expense and effort of having to shore your tunnel up with wood would be negated. And in fact, Tunnel 29 will be shored with wood, but only every six feet. Um, the matrix of soil here would suit not just Tunnel 29, but also Tunnel 57 which was only just down the road. But what we're going to do now is go over there to the west, into the French sector, where this ruins of the factory used to be, and we'll think about the two Italians that initiated the tunnel. So, follow me, let's think about the story of Tunnel 29. So, over there, that's where I've just been, the wasteland. And this area was already famous, because when the wall was built in 1961, right there on the corner, Rupina Strasse, Bernauerstrasse, that is where the famous Konrad Schumann picture was taken a picture that would go around the world. Um, Conrad Schumann, an East German um, policeman who jumped the wire and ran into a truck here and escaped to the west. Um, but here's the death strip. The wall would run on the other side of the road. And this area was then scoped out by the initiators of Tunnel 29. And their names were uh, two Italian engineering students, Mr. Spina and Mr. Sester. And other people, of course, would offer their services. Let me help dig the tunnel. I can get my relatives and loved ones out as well. So you had uh, around 20, 21 people involved in the tunnel. But on the other side of the road, where this building that was built to kindergarten was built 20 years ago, that's where the ruins of the house would have been, at the back of that area over there. So it would begin here. It would then run 15, 16 metres below the ground, 155 metres long. Beyond where these modern buildings are, older houses stood there that were then destroyed. There was then another set of houses, and then the Schoenholtstrasse, and that is where the tunnel would come out. So we'll wander down there and have a think about that. So I'm back on the uh, eastern side, or the death strip side. Um, those metal pipes immediately behind me, standing up, that's where the wall used to be, and those trees just over here, that's where the ruins of the factory where the tunnel started um, would be situated. Now, Spina and Sesta, together with the uh, 18 other bods who got involved, um, most of these people were connected with the uh, engineering um, so they really went for, um, right from the beginning, very carefully planned tunnel um, that would be about as good as it was going to get. Initially, it was going to be triangular in section, shored up the entire way. They got this 10,000 mark donation of free wood, uh, and as you'll hear, they managed to fund the tunnel in a rather novel way. But it turned out that using um, this triangular form would take way too long, packing the sand in outside, the shoring, etc., etc. So they went for a square form that you could crawl down um, with shoring every two metres or six feet. That's what uh, um, they would do. Um, they put in a telephone, they had a ventilation system, uh, they had a uh, rails for a cart so they could bring the spoil from the front end of the tunnel um, to the back end and then they stored it all in the cellars. Seven rooms that they absolutely packed um, with uh, um, material. In fact, the tunnel was uh, um, produced so, so many tons of sand that by the end uh, they only had a tiny space left over to squeeze through to the tunnel shaft um, because all the rest of the cellar had been filled. But they worked on a, if we could do two metres a day, that would be a good day, um, using a, lying on their back and pushing um, the spade into the clay uh, sand matrix um, with their feet. It's the same method that miners used um, who constructed um, the great uh, tunnels um, under the German lines during World War I to try and blur them up with tons and tons of explosives. They rarely made uh, two metres a day, but um, by uh, September, uh, the tunnel had reached 155 metres. They'd come across a couple of problems. And the first was that road with the trams on it. Underneath there was a, um, uh, a water pipe. Now, 1962 was one of the wettest springs and summers Berlin, Berliners could ever remember. So when water started to come through early summer into the tunnel, I thought, well, it's just rainwater. They tried pumping as fast as they could tens of thousands of litres of water out of the tunnel using a hand pump. In fact, there was the actual water drainage pipe that ran through their cellar. They just bored a hole in it and then poured the water into there from their pumping. But then they realised that no matter how fast or hard they pumped, the water doesn't disappear and the tunnel was flooding. And they realised that the uh, must have been a leaking or broken uh, water mains pipe. So in a roundabout way, um, they managed to contact the West Berlin or the Wedding Council 
Um, and one version of the story is that the council, they hear the pipe's broken, they fix it and everything's great. Uh, another version um, is that the West Berlin Council actually knew that there was a tunnel being dug, was sort of sympathetic um, and managed to uh, have that water pipe then turned off to help the tunnelers. But eventually the water stopped, um, the tunnel dried out and they could continue. Um, until they reached the east. Now this area here, I'm walking along, this is actually the patrol path where the border patrol would walk and the tunnel, though it was very deep, they could still hear um, the feet of people walking on the pavement uh, above them. I mentioned that they got this 10,000 uh, mark donation of free wood. The other thing that made tunnel 29 um, rather special was that um, they did a deal with the NBC American TV channel um, who would pay Spina and Sesta um, somewhere in the region of 15,000 marks uh, each just walked over the line where the other wall was so we now are um, fully in East Berlin uh, we're going to turn onto the street where the <coughs> escapers would gather to come through the tunnel the Schoenholzer Strasse um, when they got that money um, it caused some problems. First amongst the tunnelling community, so one of their uh, closest confederates, a guy called Hasso Herschel, who dug his own successful tunnels after completing Tunnel 29, he's like, well, you know, where's my cut? And eventually he got a little bit of the money as well. Uh, but um, Stern magazine, various other TV channels in Germany, a year after uh, the tunnel was um, successful, um, it appeared on German TV, so they made a lot of money out of it. That caused some problems. Um, one was, it kind of gave people the idea that the reason that they were building these tunnels was to make money and that all the people that came through had to pay. Now it's true that some of the costs of tunnels uh, dug under the Berlin Wall that people paid to cover those, but it was the drive to get their loved ones out of East Berlin and live a life in the West um, that would cause this immense amount of effort and risk um, rather than uh, um, for financial gain, which sort of damaged the tu uh, tunnelling and escape helpers' reputations. The other um, problem with the NBC funding and the publishing of the film after the successful tunnel escape was that it gave East Germany a propaganda in um, to say, check it out, it wasn't really NBC, it's the Western Secret Services and they're using these tunnels to smuggle agents into the country, you know, that kind of stuff, which they did, um, and that caused uh, um, some issues as well. Uh, but NBC did film it, they did get paid, um, and uh, the tunnel would roll along until it was about 155 metres long. Now this is the Schoenholzer Strasse, and it was just down here behind us, where um, it was from the cellar of the back of that building, number six, that the tunnel would end or begin, depending on if, um, if you were escaping or not. The original plan was to go another block that way. Um, there was a Bulgarian or a Romanian who lived in the house there, and they thought uh, they'd done a deal with him um, that they could use his cellar. But unfortunately, there was another pipe break and the tunnel started to flood. And this time it was under this street in East Berlin. They had no way of stopping that. Um, perhaps one of the bravest of the people involved was a woman called Ellen from Dusseldorf. Her job was to come into the east, um, meet the escapees in a bar and bring them to a place they didn't know about, of course, for security reasons this house up here <coughs> where they were going to begin their tunnel escape, them, their kids, etc. Um, Halfway through their Tunnel 29 operation, they heard that another one had been um, exposed by East Germany, and those Western tunnelers caught in the tunnel were sentenced to six years in prison. So you can't um, underestimate the bravery of those building the tunnel, or could you crawl down a tunnel um, half a metre by half a metre for 155 metres that's filling up with water? You know, you really got to want to get out um, to do that. Either way, <clears throat> they come through the cellar, Ellen brings them in on the first night. 29 people came through and it was through this door they went down into the cellar and then 155 meters under those new houses under the death strip under the Bernauer Strasse to the ruined factory where we've already been they wanted to bring more out they could have brought more out had the tunnel not being flooded but the water had got so bad the tunnel was submerged they abandoned it and that caused some grief because some of the people who joined later to help build the tunnel, their um, relatives didn't manage to get out. Uh, and now, of course, that put a bit of a dampener on the celebration party where some of the tables reserved for some of the tunnelers and their relatives who didn't get out were left empty. But Tunnel 29, a fantastic story. That was the first successful tunnel under the Berlin Wall after it was built in 1961. But just after, there was another tunnel, Tunnel 57, and from the name, you'll realize that that was even more successful. And that was only a few blocks from here, 
Let's go down, I'm further down the Benauer Strasse, and I'll tell you about Tunnel 57. Now, just up here, that's the Schoenholzer Strasse where Tunnel 29 came out, and it'll be dug. Here's where the wall used to be, the metal posts again, from just up there, 155 metres. And two years later, Tunnel 57 will be built on the Benauer Strasse. So this is the west here, and we're standing on the line of the wall, and here we can look down into Communist East Berlin, great view of the TV tower. This metal thing here commemorates where one of the guard towers used to be. And the house where Tunnel 57 would see 57 people, hence the name Escape From, would be on this Strelitzer Strasse just down there. But the tunnel itself, very long, would begin where these 70s buildings stand. Now, just like a Tunnel uh, 29, the ruins of the buildings are no longer there, but it was from the cellar this house here, and it used to be a bakery, so that was ideal, that would be rented by students. Among them, a guy called uh, Christian Tubel, he was a medical student. Another was a guy called Führer, he would actually go on, a physics student, to go on to become one of Germany's first astronauts. But they rent it, saying that they're a photography club, and they want to use it as a dark room, and they start digging under here. This is where the houses used to be. You might remember the famous houses. Those images from the Berlin Wall, the houses that were here were removed. This is where East Germany bricked them up and people jumped from the windows down onto this, the pavement here in the west. But they dug all under here, under this house, and eventually came up a little bit short. Now, let's wander down to the exit house and think about uh, another way we can think about the story. Now, towards the end of their tunneling operation, the tunnelers realised they must have made some sort of miscalculation. They were coming up too fast, too steeply. Um, so when they came out, they came short of the cellar itself, but they came out in what was a back courtyard where sort of a disused outside um, toilet building stood. But it was pretty good cover, so they thought they'd use that. Um, so um, armed, because escape helpers who were being shot by East German border guards. They discover the tunnel, they wait for them to come through, and then without warning, in some cases, they shoot them. Heinz Jerscher was one of the escape helpers that they knew who'd been killed. Um, so they're armed with pistols. Um, they'd come through. One would be at the entrance to the tunnel in the courtyard by the disused outside toilet building. One would be in the corridor. One would be at the front door of the house. And on the first night, 28 people come through. So they're welcomed. They have to give the code name. And the code name was Tokyo. Take off your shoes with your little case. Go through into the courtyard. And then they were lowered down the shaft on a kind of a swing affair. And then they'd have to wriggle through. This was a very small tunnel. You couldn't crawl. You had to wriggle through. Uh, it took about 10 minutes um, to, uh, to go through the tunnel. First night, everything was great. There were no problems. So they thought, as we step now over where the first barrier used to, the second barrier used to be, now we're in East Berlin, they thought, um, let's do it again. And on the second night, everything went okay as well. Just turn around so you get a view into the east. Second night, everything was okay until just before midnight. Now they had a telephone, field telephone operation and just before midnight, a telephone came through to the sharp end of the tunnel here in the east that no one else was expected. So it was quite strange when the guy at the door, two people appear. Now, there was a rumor that there were already Ministry for State Security, so Stasi informants, um, amongst the group of uh, people rivaling for a place within the tunnel. But apparently they didn't know where the tunnel was. But just before midnight, two men appear and they didn't know the code word, Tokyo. The guy on the door has to make a decision and it's the wrong one. He'd already been told no one else was coming. But these guys say, wait a minute, we don't know the code word, but we're waiting for a third friend of ours. Just wait a few minutes, everything's gonna be cool. So they decide to take the risk. Now what the, these people, what this third man was doing was contacting a rapid response force of the border police headed up by a young man, trainee teacher, called Egon Schultz. Egon Schultz was a couple of blocks away. They burned down here. They smashed through the door. And a physics student, future astronaut Furrer, is like, the game is up, let us bail. So they all run through into the courtyard. And here you can see this was the house. That was the door. You can see there's a 
commemorative plaque there commemorating this. And they all try and pile into the tunnel, the escapees, so much, you know, so quickly, they actually kind of land on top of each other and eventually block it. So through these doors crash Egon Schultz and his uh, um, compadres, uh, and they start rushing into the courtyard. And Christian Sobel, the last man, the medical student, shot at Egon Schultz. Pretty sure he'd hit him. Uh, but he bails into the tunnel they managed to get all the way through. Now, luckily, perhaps, they didn't actually know where the entrance to the tunnel was or they're looking after Schultz um, because Egon Schultz, the next day, it becomes uh, uh, known that Egon Schultz has died. Now, East Germany made massive, massive uh, propaganda out of this. They named schools after him. There was a state funeral. They report he's been gunned down by these evil gangster Western capitalists who are coming through to spy on the East or sabotage or rather than just... Uh, civilians who'd dedicated months of their lives to digging a tunnel to get their relatives out. But um, Egon Schultz becomes sort of a folk hero. Christian Zubel, um, the guy who'd shot him, of course, was pretty traumatized by this event for the rest of his life um, and uh, um, tragically would be dead before, um, after the fall of the wall, East German documentation could be made available to historians, one of which was the Egon Schultz autopsy. And even though it was known to East Germany at the time, um, what seems to have happened is Egon Schultz was shot by Christian Tobel in the shoulder with this small caliber pistol. Now that would have, you know, that hurts, but it's not going to, it wouldn't have killed him. He was actually killed by friendly fire. His friends opened with, you know, his colleagues and the East German border guards open up with, uh, with their uh, Kalashnikovs and it would be those bullets that actually killed him. Um, so a rather tragic end. Uh, the tunnel, of course, had been busted. Um, that was the end of that. But 57 people came through Tunnel 57, the most successful tunnel on the Berlin Wall. Either way, cool stories um, and uh, hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next time.